This video was brought to you by Incogni. What's happening in Gaza right now has provided a stark reminder of the latent geopolitical tensions in the Middle East, and more specifically, the de facto Cold War between Israel and Iran. On Thursday, Israel bombed Damascus and Aleppo airports on the day that the Iranian foreign minister was due to arrive in Syria. And Iran will be at least considering getting involved in Gaza, given the dramatic scale of the Israeli response against Iran's ally, Hamas. So in this video, we're going to take a look at Iran's network of allies, sometimes known as the Axis of Resistance, as well as taking a closer look at Iran's relationship with Hamas, and whether it could lead them to getting involved in the Gaza conflict. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So to understand Iran's proxy network, we need to go back to the Iranian Revolution in 1979, when veteran Shia cleric Ayatollah Khomeini overthrew the US-backed Shah of Iran, who himself came to power in 1953 via a CIA-backed coup against Iran's first democratically elected leader. Anyway, while the Shah was actually relatively popular for most of his reign, a slowing economy, his authoritarian tendencies, and a series of modernizing secular reforms created a diverse anti-Shah coalition in the late 70s that included everyone from Iranian communists through to Shia Islamists. And this is something that's often forgotten about the Iranian revolution. While the Ayatollah did play a pivotal role, it was only after the Shah was ousted that the Ayatollahs monopolized power by purging other anti-Shah revolutionaries. However, almost immediately after this revolution, Iraq invaded Iran. Iraq's leader, Saddam Hussein, was trying to take advantage of this political chaos in Iran and deter Iraq's Shia majority from emulating the Iranian revolution. But things didn't quite go to plan. Despite receiving support from Saudi Arabia, the West, and the Soviet Union, Saddam was unable to defeat Iran. Even though the Ayatollahs won the war, though, the experience created an understandable paranoia in Iran's foreign policy establishment. So in the 80s, they decided that while they couldn't match their enemies for conventional military power, they could keep themselves safe by using proxies. The first real Iranian proxy was Hezbollah in Lebanon, which grew out of the Lebanese Shia political movement in the 1970s. While the Sunni Shia divide is often exaggerated in Western media, it's largely true that the 1979 revolution provided an inspiration and political framework for other Shias across the Middle East. For context, until the latter half of the 20th century, many Shia Muslims basically just stayed out of politics, both for reasons to do with Shia doctrine and because they often found themselves living as minorities in Sunni polities. However, by the late 20th century, Shia Muslims started mobilizing for better political representation, including in Lebanon, where Shia Muslims were politically underrepresented compared to Lebanese Sunnis and Christians. In 1982 then, when Israel invaded Shia majority areas in southern Lebanon to purge the Palestinian Liberation Organization, Iran saw an opportunity. Days after Israel's invasion, Hezbollah was secretly created by a small group of pro-Iran Shia clerics with the support of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. With Iranian training and funding, Hezbollah waged a constant and costly guerrilla war against Israel, until Israel finally left Lebanon in 2000, before they went on to establish themselves as the de facto government in southern Lebanon and a major player in formal Lebanese politics. Today, in part thanks to hundreds of millions of dollars of Iranian funding, Hezbollah has a bigger military than most countries, with an estimated 50 thousand troops and something like a hundred thousand missiles. Hezbollah have also helped to advance Iranian interests in Yemen, Syria, and Iraq. And this success even convinced Iran that proxies really were the way to go. 
Accordingly, when Iraq collapsed into chaos after the US-led invasion in 2003, Iran reacted by supporting certain Shia militia groups, both because Iran saw an opportunity to expand its sphere of influence and because Iran was worried that political instability in Iraq could spill over into Iran or be exploited by its regional ally, Saudi Arabia. Today, more than a dozen Iraqi political parties and a number of paramilitary groups have ties to Iran, and Iran has basically infiltrated most of Iraq's political class. Even the US reluctantly recognizes this fact. A report published by the US Army in 2018 admitted that at the time of the report's completion, an emboldened and expansionist Iran appears to be the only victor out of the Iraq war. Iran also saw another opportunity in Syria after the Arab Spring protests in 2011, which quickly gave way to a civil war. As a Shia in a sunny majority country, Assad and Iran made natural allies, and Iranian support helped Assad hold on to a majority of Syria's territory, despite the fact that the anti-Assad rebellion had numerical superiority and support from the West. Not only that, in the late 2000s, Iran saw yet another opportunity in Yemen, where the Houthis were fighting an insurgency against the government that would later escalate into a full-scale civil war. Thanks to financial and military support from Hezbollah and Iran's Quds Force, the Houthis evolved from a local guerrilla group into a fully-fledged army that's now fighting against the Saudi-led coalition. The Houthis are more autonomous than Iran's other proxies, coming from different branches of Shia Islam with their own regional agenda. But they at least share a similar worldview, as experienced by the Iranian revolutionary-inspired Houthi slogan, and they have been an invaluable partner to Iran in its cold war against Saudi Arabia. Finally then, let's talk about Hamas, another key element of Iran's power. Now, Hamas were originally founded after the first Enfitada, as a Palestinian offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, with the stated mission of eradicating Israel. It was one of few hardline Palestinian groups to condemn the 1993 Oslo Peace Accords, which saw the establishment of a Palestinian authority and the renunciation of violence by the Palestine Liberation Organization. After winning the 2006 Palestinian legislative elections, Hamas kicked other Palestinian groups out of Gaza and seized control of the Strip in 2007. Now, as Hamas established themselves as the foremost anti-Israel militia in Palestine, it quickly developed a relationship with Iran based on a mutual antipathy towards Israel. Even though Hamas are Sunni Muslims, Iran is still one of Hamas's biggest supporters, providing funding, weapons, and training. All in all, Hamas, as well as other smaller groups, including the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, are thought to receive some $100 million in support annually from Iran. Now, Hamas isn't necessarily a proxy for Iran in the same way that Hezbollah is, and they ended up on opposing sides during the Syrian civil war, but their shared interest in Israel's downfall has made them strategic allies. Unfortunately for Hamas, however, Iran is unlikely to get involved in the current conflict, despite this common ground. And that's for three reasons. First, Hamas is more of a convenient strategic partner than an ally. Second, it would almost definitely provoke a massive response from the US. But third, Iranian intervention would turn the war in Gaza into a war against not just Palestine, but also Iran, which could, paradoxically, undermine Palestine and Hamas's cause amongst other Arab states, which don't like Israel, also don't like Iran. A couple of years ago, I was the victim of identity theft, and I only found out when I got a court letter saying that I owed money to a broadband company at an address I'd never lived at. And I'm not alone here either, with victims of data breaches rising by 41.5% in 2022. 
Now, all of that stolen data is very often being added to commercial databases, with data brokers potentially aggregating your personal information, including your name and aliases, social security number, login credentials, home address, location history, online activity, and more, all of which is available for purchase by businesses and could fall into the hands of criminals too. Fortunately though, Incogni are here to help. That's because Incogni reach out to data brokers on your behalf, request your data's removal, and deal with any objections. Plus, as brokers often continue to collect data even after takedown requests, Incogni continue to keep watch. So whenever a new record pops up on a data broker site, Incogni will automatically take care of that too. And even if you're not worried about your data being stolen, we all deal with endless junk mail and robocallers, both issues that Incogni services could help cut down. So create an account using our link in the description, grant Incogni the ability to work on your behalf and sit back as they make you safer. Plus, by using our link, you'll get an exclusive 60% off an annual Incogni plan. Thanks for checking them out, using our link, and thanks to Incogni for sponsoring this video.